Good morning. Good morning. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Josh and I'm excited to be here to uh, bring God's Word. If you have a Bible, uh, why don't you open it at 1 Corinthians 2. Um, if you don't have a Bible, uh, go to your nearest hotel room. Second drawer on the right. Steal yourself, Gideons. Um, we're in week five in this series. And what I really want to do today is ask this question to start with, which is what is God's vision for our church? What is God's vision for our church? Let's jump in verse 12. Uh, Paul writes this, What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. He just spent a few chapters talking about the gospel and the cross. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Chapter 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? So after a couple of chapters on the cross, Paul begins to share now how the cross should impact our lives. And he gives the uh, church in Corinth this rebuke. And I want to hang my sermon on um, the first verse of chapter 3, where he says this, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Paul says to the church, the followers of Jesus there, essentially this, you are still babies. He says you are still infants. He says, I want to speak to you as grown-ups, as people who live by the Spirit, as those who are mature in Christ, but I can't. Because you are living as infants. Now, if I was to go around the room and ask every single person, what is God's vision for our church? I think I'd get quite a lot of different answers, a lot of wonderful answers. Some might say God's vision is for us to be a community of worshippers. Others might say God's vision is that we'd be a people of the word of God. Some might say we're called to be a people who love our city and invite people home. Others that we're called to be a welcoming and inclusive community where everyone is welcome. Some might say his vision is a place where the supernatural would be manifest, that heaven would invade earth in power every single week. Others for us to be a generous church or a safe church where the vulnerable and the broken can come and, and be cared for and protected or a place of love. Uh, where we love one another deeply and authentically. Or maybe it's that God, that we'd be a community to go after the nations and fight for reconciliation and justice, a place of healing, the care for the poor. There could be so many answers to this question, what is God's vision for our church? And all of that is true, by the way. But I want to suggest that all of those things are evidences or manifestations of a bigger vision that God has for our church community. And it's a vision that isn't particularly exciting. Uh, it isn't particularly appealing. It, it might not necessarily get you standing off your seat or on your seat excited, uh, although it should. But this is God's vision for our church, and it's this. God's vision for the whole vineyard is maturity. God's vision for our church is maturity. And we see this throughout the New Testament. Let me read you a few verses. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, a few chapters after uh, this passage in the same book, um, Paul writes this, When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Paul says that just like children grow up, Physically and neurologically, so too are followers of Jesus called to grow up spiritually. Colossians 1, 28 to 29, Paul writes this, We, pro we proclaim Christ Christ. 
warning everybody and teaching everybody in all wisdom that we may present everybody mature in Christ. Notice the repetition of the word everybody. The vision is for everybody to mature in Christ. James 1 speaks of how we become mature. He says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And finally, Ephesians 4 is one of the most beautiful passages on God's vision for the church. And this is what it says, verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and we become, everyone, mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. God's desire for us, church, is that we would become mature. So what is maturity? Paul says in in that Ephesians passage that to be spiritually mature is this, to grow up to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Not a half measure of the fullness of Christ, Not a fraction of the fullness of Christ, not a thimbleful of the fullness of Christ, but God's desire and vision for every single one of us is that we would grow spiritually into the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Isn't that an incredible vision? Maturity is a lifelong partnership with the Holy Spirit who works in us to transform us into the image of Jesus. This is sanctification. Maturity is that the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the things that so characterize the life of Jesus, a love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control would be manifest in our lives. Notice spiritual maturity is not about your ability. It's not about your gifting. It's not about your competence. How many of you know our city doesn't need more impressive Christians? Our city needs more mature Christians. So I want to share five reflections on maturity and immaturity from this passage. Number one, if you're making notes, feel free to write this down. Number one, spiritual maturity is a choice that we have to make. The church in Corinth was planted maybe five years before Paul wrote this letter. And Paul says, guys, after all this time, you're still infants. You haven't aged a day You see, the church in Corinth, in many ways, was a successful church. It had grown numerically. It had grown in influence. It demonstrated the power of the Holy Spirit through signs and wonders and gifts in a way that no other church did. But Paul's issue was this. Church, you are not growing in depth. Now, this tells me, as I read this, that actually maturity doesn't just happen. It is a choice for Christians. It tells me that you can look as a community successful from the outside, but resist growing on the inside. And this is such an important principle, isn't it, for followers of Jesus, that growing in maturity doesn't just happen. A lot of Christians, kind of like the church in Corinth, if we're really honest, we've been going through the motions, we've been coming to church every week, we've been doing lots of good stuff, but, but if we assess our lives today... And where we were a year ago or two years ago, we may actually, if we're honest, think, I am the same today as I was back then. Some Christians are the same today as they were 10 years ago. I don't want to be a Christian that's the same when I'm 50 as I am now when I'm 33. I want to grow up before I grow old. Spiritual maturity doesn't just happen. In fact, spiritual atrophy is our natural state. It's like if you don't work out in the gym, your muscles will waste away. I used to go surfing in Cornwall, bodyboarding in Cornwall, can't surf. Um, But here's what I learned very quickly is that there's always a current in the water. You have to constantly resist the current and swim against the tide or in a matter of moments you'll have drifted outside of the red and yellow flags and be somewhere that you don't want to be. Our world, just like first century Corinth, has a current. 
there is a tide in our culture, and unless we swim against this tide, we will end up swept to a place we don't want to be of immaturity. We are bombarded, aren't we, by cultural narratives, persuasive ideals, news feeds, discipling us in how we should live and how we should think and what our values should be and what we should do with our bodies and all of that sort of stuff. And the purpose of that is to form us into the image of the world. We are all being formed at all times. The question is not, are we being formed? The question is, who is forming us and into whose image are we being formed? The world is a disciple-making machine and is excellent at it. There's no treading water in this. We are either actively or proactively partnering with the Spirit of God to be formed into the likeness of Jesus in maturity or we are being deformed out of his image into the likeness of the world. So maturity is a choice and we have to go there. Number two, immature Christians, Paul says, are worldly. Uh, he says this, brothers and sisters, I couldn't address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, as infants in Christ. Paul says this, two things. Guys, you're, you're living worldly lives. You are infants. It's interesting to me that one of Paul's main markers for spiritual immaturity is this, that your life looks no different to the world. We're called, aren't we, as a church to be a people set apart a people who live in the world but not of the world, a people who are consecrated, a people who are called, a people who are travelers. Uh, this world is not our home. We are sojourners. We are on a journey through this life. We're called to be different. We're called to be consecrated. Paul says, guys, you just look like the world around you. And so here's the challenge for us today in Hull, that if our lives, if our language, if how we spend our time and what we do with our bodies and our attitudes and what we watch and look at, if my life looks just like my mates who don't know Jesus, Paul might suggest we have an immature faith. A mature faith moves beyond what we believe, moves beyond our theology into our biography. And let me say, I have been there. Trust me. I look back at my early years as a follower of Jesus, I think I was so immature. My friend once said to me when I was a student, you know, Josh, I'd never know you were a Christian by the way you live your life. It broke my heart. And I realized I was living with my words saying I'm a follower of Jesus, but with my life living like everyone else. We're called out of the world not to live a worldly life. Number three, immature Christians consume milk, not solid food. I have a baby uh, called Jesse, who is just over two months old. And I want to say something. I don't want to make this weird, right? But breastfeeding babies are beautiful. You know, watching a, a baby breastfeed is not, not like that, but um, it's a beautiful thing. Right, hear my heart. It's a beautiful thing. Um, a breastfeeding baby is beautiful, but a breastfeeding 50-year-old is creepy. <laughs> we all on the same page. Lots of hands, knocks going up. All right. Um, <laughs> Sorry to make it weird. I think we'd all agree with that. And Paul is likening immature Christians to breastfeeding adults. He's like, guys, it's not meant to be like this. Something not quite right here. God's heart for you is for you to grow and mature and eat solid food and go on a journey of multiplication and fruitfulness. And a lot of Christians in there and even in now, we're like living in nappies our whole life. We don't want to be Benjamin Button Christians, do we? We want to step into the fullness of what God has for us. We want to grow old. We want to grow up before we grow old. Get it right. So for us, here's a question. Are we investing in our spiritual growth? Are we living off milk or are we eating solid food? Think about what we allow into our minds and lives and bodies. What are we consuming? Here's a few questions. What are we reading and watching and looking at? What are the voices that we listen to? The words that we believe? How do we spend our time? Who are the people that we surround ourselves with that shape us, that form us, our relationships? When we wake up in the morning, whose voice takes priority? Do we begin the day in prayer, connecting with our Heavenly Father with an open Bible, or are we on social media? I can say I've done this as an unintentional experiment for a long time. And the days that I wake up and I refuse to go on my phone before I spend time with Jesus are the days I feel most connected to God. 
most sensitive to his voice, most hungry for his presence, most receptive to what he's doing in my life so I can respond. The days that I wake up and I just think, oh, let me just check social media, whatever it might be, listen to the news feeds, the, uh, the, the, the BBC website, whatever. When I, when I make that the primary voice in my life, I find myself becoming more irritable, distracted, cynical, and disillusioned. Has anyone else? Anyone else experienced that? And so it's so important um, that we recognize that our maturity and our spiritual formation is helped by spiritual disciplines. Now, I talk about spiritual disciplines such as by reading the Bible, prayer, fasting, Sabbath, solitude. These are not ends in and of themselves. It doesn't get you any more good ticks in, in God's books. What they are is they're like a, a spiritual anchor that you drop in the cultural current of our world And they hold you in a place where the presence of God can meet you and bring transformation and maturity. So it's really, really helpful and important. And you've got to work out your own rhythms. Number four. um, Oh, before I move on to number four, a top tip for maturity. Get connected in a regular weekly home group. I really believe in home groups. I believe they are life and, and uh, a place where you can surround yourself with people who will help grow you. If you're not in one, I'd encourage you to get in one. We've got forms at the back. If you're in one but you don't go to one, I'd encourage you to get along to one. Uh, they are transformational and amazing. Number four, immature Christians are self-centered instead of others serving. Paul writes this in verse three. You're still worldly, For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? He goes on to speak about serving. Now, this is real practical. Paul gives evidences, two evidences of a life that is immature, spiritual infancy. Number one, he says uh, jealousy. Jealousy speaks of a discontent with what we have and a desire for what we don't. Jealousy is when our vision is not on Jesus, but on people. Jealousy is when our goal is self-promotion and self-preservation and we want to look good, so I want what they have or I want what they are. Jealousy is the overflow of insecurity, small-mindedness, ungratefulness. And Paul says, that stuff, take it off. It's not fit for you. Number two, quarreling. Again, this speaks of entitlement. It speaks of a my way or the highway. I need to be right. Uh, I need to prove myself. I need to win the argument. Paul says this is a major marker of insecurity. He's like, guys, you're acting like babies, but instead of being self-focused like those two things, here's what I want you to do. I want you to serve others. The verse after, I think, Paul just begins to unpack what it means to serve. And so a major marker for maturity is how well do we serve people? How well do we lay down our preferences for others? How well do we give of our time and our energy and our money and our gifts, give what we have for the sake of a cause which doesn't benefit us? How well do we do this? And I want to say in this church, we we are, I think we're doing really well. We have hundreds of people who give their time and money and and just to make this place happen. The, The people that are serving on teams, you guys are heroes. We have so many. And if you're listening to this thinking, do you know what? I do feel maybe like I'm living in immaturity. I'd say join a team. Find a place where you can serve and you'll begin to grow and step up in maturity. Number five, coming into land now, mature Christians are more than mere humans. I love this verse. Paul writes this, Since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? I wonder whether whoever was reading that out said this to the church in Corinth, are you not acting like mere humans? And they might have replied something like, which I did when I read this, um, <clears throat> Paul, yeah, kind of, because I am a human. Like, well, what are you trying to say? To which Paul might have replied, yes, but not entirely. We have the Spirit of God, church, who lives in us. He's made his home in us. When we get born again, we are no longer mere humans. We are called to a new way of life. We belong to another world. This world is not our home. We've been born again. We are new creatures born of spirit. We are the righteousness of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. Paul says in Ephesians, we are seated in heavenly places. We have an eternal inheritance. Heaven is our home. Paul says, I want you to live from that place into the here and now. 
resist the cultural current of our world, refuse to live there and know who you are and whose you are. And as we do that, we will begin to grow up into the fullness of God. And what will happen is that we'll be a church of hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people who live and look like Jesus and our world and our city will never be the same. This is the vision for Christian maturity. We will grow up into Christ in fullness, with increasing clarity, that through the seasons of life, we would walk with him and his spirit would work in us to mature us to completion. And the words of James in another translation, perfection. A life is possible where sin is the exception rather than the rule. And that is where God is calling us to do where we walk with the fruit of the Spirit manifesting in our lives in greater measure until we get called home. Amen.